Good morning, morning Alessandro. Alessandro. Ah, Jax, Jane. Thank you so much for coming here to help me. So, how can we help you, Alessandro? You know how I'm always working towards making this uh, restaurant the best in a Jollydale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From tomorrow, Alessandro's restaurant will start serving a variety of fruit juices to the people of Jollydale. <laughs> Whoa! But there is a problem. I have to order all the fruits I need to make the juices by evening, and I don't know how many of them I should order. Some juices might be more popular than the others. It will all depend on what the customers like. Exactly. If I buy all of the fruits in equal quantities, some of them might go to waste. And you kids know that we should never waste food. Now I need the two of you to help me make sure no food goes to waste. Absolutely. How can we help you? I want the two of you to do a juice survey. I would have done it myself, but there is just too much work in the restaurant. A juice survey? Yes, you have to go out and ask people what their favorite juice is. They can choose from uh, pineapple juice, carrot juice, apple juice, and orange juice. Understood. We will do the survey and come back soon. Here you go. We spoke to a lot of people today. Good job, kids. I see you have used tally marks to count the number of people in the survey. We can now use this data to create a bar graph. Why do we need a bar graph? A bar graph makes it easier to read and compare data visually. By looking at a bar graph, we can easily find out which types of juices are most liked and which ones are least liked. How are we going to make a bar graph using tally marks? We will make a vertical bar graph using the data in the survey that the two of you did. Vertical bar graphs represent data vertically. The first thing we should decide is its title. How about we name the graph Juice Survey? That is perfect. Next, we'll draw the axis. There are two axes in a bar graph, vertical and horizontal. Here, the horizontal axis represents the types of fruit juices, and the vertical axis represents the count of people. The data that tells us about the count of people will be on the vertical axis, so the bars will expand vertically. Got it! First, we write the types of fruit juices on the horizontal axis to decide where their bars will be drawn. Now, let's call each box on this graph a unit. To decide how to plot our data on the graph, we must check the smallest and largest numbers that must go on the vertical axis. We always start at zero and extend up to the largest number we have in our collected data. We also need to ensure that the numbers on the axis are spread out evenly. For this, we must define what one unit, in this case, one box on this graph paper, stands for. Um, um wait, uh, there seems to be a problem. The maximum number on the vertical axis is 20, but the count of people who like orange juice is 30. How are we supposed to have a 30-unit long bar when the vertical axis only goes up to 20? Oh, no. There's got to be a better way. I have an idea. What if we put an extra page above the one we're working on? That way, we can extend the vertical axis onto the next page. Oh! That is a very interesting idea, Jax. I'm, I'm like, really smart. Of course you are, Jax, but there's an easier way to do this. We can use a scale to fit all the data from the table into the graph. What? 
What's, what's that about a snail? <laughs> no, not a snail, Jax, a scale. We can change the scale of our graph to fit larger numbers on it easily. We can do this by deciding on our own measurements for the graph. For example, in a pictograph, a certain symbol stands for a specific number of items on the graph. This becomes the scale of the pictograph. Similarly, for a bar graph, we can fix what one unit on the graph, in this case, one square on this paper, stands for. That will be the scale of the bar graph. We can change the scale of our graph where one unit on the vertical axis represents two people who like a particular fruit juice. Oh, I think I get it. The scale will help us reduce the height of the graph. That way, we can easily fit the bar of orange juice into our graph. Let's do it! In this graph, the vertical axis represents the count of people who like a particular juice. When we use a scale, each unit of the vertical axis will equal to two counts of people. The numbers on the vertical axis of this graph will increase in twos. We start at zero and increase by two for each unit. So it will be zero, two, four, six, and so on till 30. Yes, the number of people who like pineapple juice is 16, and each unit on the vertical axis represents two people. So, the length of the bar representing pineapple juice will be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. 16 units, which is equal to eight boxes of the graph. Next, we have carrot juice. The length of the bar representing carrot juice will be 14 units, which will be equal to seven boxes of the graph. Similarly, the length of the bar that represents apple juice will be 18 units, which will be equal to nine boxes of the graph. Oh, my favorite orange juice. The length of the bar that represents orange juice will be 30 units, which will be equal to 15 boxes of the graph. All the bars fit perfectly in the graph. We did it! Great work, kids! Oh, thank you so much for helping me. See, we can now easily find out which types of juices are most liked and which ones are least liked. Mm. Yes! I can see that my favorite orange juice is liked by 30 people, which is the most liked here. So, according to the survey, people seem to like orange juice the most. Then comes apple juice, which is the second most liked. After that comes pineapple juice. And then, at last, we have carrot juice. Ah, now that I have all the information I need, I can confidently place the order for fruits I'll need accordingly. 